All righty, we're ready to start. I apologize for that brief delay. Welcome everybody to the um, spring 2023 CNI member meeting. I'm delighted you're here with us in Denver. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, before we get into the opening plenary, I just have a few um, logistical announcements and related uh, matters. I am Cliff Lynch. Uh, I am the director of CNI. For those of you, I've not had the pleasure of meeting in person yet, although I am um, <clears throat> thrilled to see so many familiar faces here. I would note um, we had a uh, session for first time attendees. It was um, once again quite well attended. Uh, we probably have at least uh, 40 or so first time attendees here and um, I'd urge you to, those of you uh, who are CNI attendees of long standing, to make them welcome. I'd also like to extend a special welcome to our fellows from um, the Association of Research Libraries LCDB program, and of course to our CLEAR fellows. And um, we have uh, some CLEAR fellows here with us that I'll be uh, introducing in just a few minutes. Uh, we also, I believe, have some additional CLEAR fellows uh, with us in the audience, and um, I'm delighted about that, too. I'd like to welcome our international member reps, our speakers, and uh, guests from abroad. Um, we're very happy to have you here, and I hope that international travel is continuing to become a uh, decreasing burden as uh, things um, go on. <clears throat> a word on COVID sorts of things. We've done our best to um, spread out the rooms a little more as we have in all of our uh, meetings since we began uh, meeting in person again. And uh, I hope that you find that um, comfortable. Um, we don't have a masking requirement, but Masks are very welcome, and I see a number of you are wearing them. I would just, all I'll say about this is understand that people are in really different places about this, and um, I think we just all need to respect that and be respectful of it. We have a great program coming up, and um, Today we'll conclude with another um, session of lightning rounds that we um, initiated uh, with our um, December 22 meeting. After the lightning rounds, we'll go right into a reception, and I hope you'll join us this afternoon for that reception. We are starting an experiment tomorrow morning at breakfast where we will have some tables designated as discussion tables. That will be very informal. There will be no report on those discussions, but it's just an opportunity to share experiences, ideas, and questions with people thinking about um, the same sorts of things. And you have a list in the um, program book of the sessions. Uh, those will include um, a session on chat GPT and related generative AI in libraries, a session on machine learning and AI in publishing. Uh, senior scholar Don Waters will talk about his um, project on um, information infrastructure for grand challenges. And we will have an update on um, open source and um, open science. And I think those are all of them, unless I've forgotten one. Uh, but they're all in the program. We'll conclude tomorrow with a present set of um, a panel moderated by James Shulman, um, which will bring together some of the commissioners from the ACLS um, Commission on Sustainable um, uh, Humanities Scholarship and um, Social Justice. 
And um, I think that's going to be a really interesting session because while that commission has been working hard for a couple of years, and you heard a little bit um, early in the pandemic about what they hope to accomplish, they're coming to the end of their term. And we will, I think, hear at least some of the high-level observations that they're making. I want to note that there are several other commissioners here um, who will not be part of that panel. Um, but are um, certainly an integral part of the CNI community. And I also urge you to chat with them about the work of the commission. We have a few minor schedule changes. Tomorrow morning, the 1055 sessions, two of them have switched rooms, um, the extended reality session and the coordinating campus um, data services have exchanged uh, venues. Um, between the windows and the grand ballroom. You can find information about that and any other changes at the bulletin board near registration. Last uh, logistical thing I want to note is that the final session before the closing plenary is kind of weird. We've got two 60-minute sessions and a 30-minute session. Um, all of this, those three sessions are really interesting. If you go to the 30-minute session, please feel free to either just hang out for a bit before the uh, plenary starts or to um, uh, join one of the 60-minute sessions in progress. Uh, we do need to wrap up the, one of those sessions in 30 minutes so that we can turn the grand ballroom for the um, closing plenary. I think that's all I've got um, in terms of logistics. While I'm welcoming folks, I also want to welcome uh, three newer rejoining measure, members. Um, one is Sage, once upon a time known as Sage Publishing, but no more, as I understand it. Um, technology from SAGE, they are rejoining. AM, a SAGE subsidiary, is also joining. And I also want to welcome Amazon Web Services as a new member represented here for the um, first time. Uh, they're doing lots of interesting things with uh, many of our members. So with that, let me turn to the matter at hand. And this is just one of these um, plenary sessions that it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce and um, sort of very lightly moderate. So in the pre-pandemic times, there was this wonderful, wonderful program that CNI supported and kind of partnered with called the Clear Fellows. And these were scholars that Clear selected that were working on <clears throat> really innovative projects, um, often but not always related to digital humanities, but always scholarship with an important digital dimension and one that built on various kinds of content resources that our, our libraries were involved in. They used to join us at our meetings pre-pandemic. Um, entire cadres of them. And you could always tell them because they were the ones asking the really interesting questions in the sessions um, during the Q&A. Um, they, um, they were really valued as members of our community. And in fact, many of them after their terms as Clear Fellows found permanent homes at CNI member institutions. Then there was the pandemic, and as so many other things, um, everything changed. We were really concerned about the ability of the Clear Fellows to not, not to do their work. They did their work through the pandemic. They did it marvelously and did tremendous things. But their ability to connect with the broader community when everybody became so disconnected and moved into uh, virtual land. We tried to highlight some of that work in our virtual meetings during the pandemic. But now we're back in person. And I thought it would really be appropriate to highlight a f at least a few of the Clear Fellows from the two most recent um, cohorts and look at their wonderful scholarship. 
I think that as you hear about the projects that they're doing, the work that they're doing, you will begin to get a vital perspective on where the future of scholarly work is going. Um, not the only perspective, but a really important one that you might not get in other ways. I'm going to ask each of the Clear Fellows who are with us, um, and we're just going to go in order to introduce themselves briefly, um, talk a little bit about their work, their experiences as a fellow, um, uh, and particularly a little bit about going through the pandemic and then returning, out, coming out of the pandemic, a bit about their aspirations and their challenges as scholars um, going in, taking a really unusual and innovative path for their scholarship and their careers. Um, I'm going to ask each of them to go about 10 or 12 minutes. And um, they, they, we're going to be switching off some laptops, and hopefully that's all going to go smoothly. And if not, we're going to wing it and do the best we can, and it's all going to be fine. Um, after that, I have a couple questions. We'll open it up to uh, the audience for a few questions. So I'll shut up. You don't want to hear from me. You want to hear from our clear fellows. And I'll invite um, Dr. Portia Hopkins. Thank you for being here to begin this set of talks. Yeah, how do I get my screen up there? Um, I think they can switch it. OK. Will you switch it for me? There you go. Oh, there we go. OK, perfect. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Portia Hopkins. I am a CLEAR DLF Fellow at Rice University. It's a joint appointment between the Center for Engaged Research and Learning and the Fondren Library. It is my honor to be here today, so I want to thank CNI, CLEAR, DLF, and Rice University for this opportunity. My presentation is entitled, Exploring Houston's Black Experiences. When I first started this fellowship, I was so excited to be able to dig deeper into my city, but it was in the middle of the pandemic. So it made it very difficult for me as a scholar who engages with communities through oral history and communal um, archiving to engage with them in the way that I normally would sans pandemic. However, as scholars, we are um, gracious in our opportunity and we're also innovative in our practice. And so, at my, during my time at Rice, um, I was able to participate in a number of projects. I just want to highlight a few. And the remainder of the time I will use to talk about the most recent project, the Black Houston Symposium. When I came to Rice, I started working with Ple uh, Project Pleasantville a project that looked at the environmental and economic history of an African-American community that was founded in 1948. It was completely self-contained until the end of segregation. And my role as an oral historian was to collect some of the social and cultural histories that um, sometimes get lost in the shuffle when we're doing environmental narratives. I also was very fortunate to um, become active in the Convict Lease and Labor Project, serving as their vice president for two years. This has been a wonderful opportunity to work directly with community members who live in Fort Bend County and who were affected by the Sugarland 95. In 2018, there were 95 bodies found at a Fort Bend ISD school site. It made national news, you might have heard about this. And so through that project, I was able to work as the vice president with the Convict Lease and Labor Project. I also started working on historical marker applications for the first interracial rodeo in Houston um, and um, helped two black businesses in Brazoria County um, obtain a historical marker at the county level. I've been doing community programming and workshops, oral history workshops with community members, as well as um, a community member who I've partnered with most recently 
named Andy Moran, who he has created an Andy's Take series. He is a very creative, interesting man. He's an art collector, and he has very interesting friends um, in their 80s and 90s. And so the project really is to collect some of these oral histories from these elders in the black community. And so as I was working on these projects, I started to think about the different ways in which these narratives could come together in a culminated space that we could talk about the research um, between community members, scholars, and hopefully also affect policy. And so this is where the Black Houston Symposium arose. Our vision and our mission to facilitate spaces for open dialogue between and across communities in order to explore the experiences of black people in Houston and to engage with scholars through collaborative research projects. And we were very successful in this for our inaugural year. Our mission to create spaces to col use collaborative research and move towards a deeper understanding of the ways in which Houston's shifting lands landscapes affect black communities and inform policy. So, I just have to note that this started as a post-it. <laughs> I was in, it did, it started as a post-it. And I am proud to say that I was in a meeting at the Fondren Library with other digital humanities scholars. And it was a brown bag luncheon, one of these very casual things that we get to know each other at the beginning of the semester. So we got together and everyone was talking about how excited they were about their future projects, all of the amazing things that we're doing at Rice University from the racial geography project, um, the task force that was created in 2019, as well as other projects, the Slave Voyages project that's also hosted currently at Rice. So we had maybe 30 or 40 people together in this room talking about the different things that they were doing and the different communities they were engaging with. But I wanted to take it a step further. How can we get communities and scholars together in a space where they can collectively have these conversations? And so it started as a post-it. It finished with a question. Will you join me in this effort? And so seven brave individuals <laughs> were tasked with helping bring this symposium to life. Known to locals as H-Town, and the prophetic city, Houston is the most ethnically diverse metropolitan area in the United States and the fourth largest city in the nation. For our purposes, the African diaspora briefly defined consists of peoples of African origins living outside the continent, irrespective of their citizenship and nationality. This symposium will provide a platform for community members and scholars to come together in order to unpack the ways in which the political, economic, and social landscapes of Houston impact the diversity of experiences for Black people in the city. And how do we contribute to this phenomenal city and to the nation and to the world? Join us for the, the Black, Black Houston, Houston Symposium! Symposium. You're so excited about this video. And let me tell you, it's not easy to make a video. I don't know if anyone's ever done this, but it's very difficult. And I have to say thank you to Des for putting this together with B-roll footage from um, Rice University and KHOU News. <laughs> So I wanted to talk a little bit about the lessons learned with my time left. As many of you are in these spaces, you recognize the hard work it takes to put an idea on paper, but then also to birth that idea into the world. And so I have a couple of lessons that I did learn. This was the inaugural Black Houston Symposium. We were so proud of our efforts, exceeds expectations, but as scholars, we also have to be critical and think about the ways that we can improve. And so the first piece of advice I would say is to build a solid team. A strong team will create the foundation for future programming and a long-standing brand. This was incredibly important. No one from our planning committee left. They actually all stayed till the end. How often does that happen? <laughs> so we were very fortunate in that regard. We wanted to foster community networks. We wanted to promote through social media, but we also recognize that word of mouth is one of the strongest tools that we can use to reach the community. And so we built strong partnerships across communities by being present in those spaces. 
We use technology. As a digital humanities scholar, this was something that came easier to me than other projects, but I recognize that you could also use technology to collect data and streamline workflows to improve for future planning. We're doing an archives launch with this Black Houston Symposium. We were able to com connect communities across archives and establish joint collections. One will be housed at the Woodson Research Center at Rice University, and the other will be housed at the African American Research and History Center, the Gregory Campus with the Houston Public Library. I was very interested in reflecting, critiquing, and improving. I came from community colleges. Um, I taught for 10 years in the community college space, and we were very much about assessment, so I did learn how to assess and how to use data-driven research to improve for the future. And also, roll with the punches. Let me just tell you, the morning of this symposium, my son got galaxy slime in his hair. Do you know what galaxy slime is? It's slime that sticks to your hair once it dries. That was two hour, two, T minus two hours before the symposium started. Um, I also burned the back of my jacket while trying to iron it. So definitely roll with the punches. Um, we had to adjust schedules. People got sick, so we, were, we had to um, adjust where necessary. Keep things light. I don't have all of the data yet because we actually just did this um, March 23rd and 24th. But of the data we did collect, we had 152 registrants, of which 67% attended both days. And for an inaugural activity symposium, we thought that was phenomenal results. We did recognize, however, that with this symposium, we had a significant number of on-site registrants, and in order for us to continue to bring community members to the community, from the community to Rice University, we understood that we had to make sure that this was a free symposium, absolutely free, so we provided um, parking validations for folks that were not able to pay for their parking on campus. Um, but we want to go further next year and possibly provide transportation for those that were not able to come to the symposium because of transportation difficulties. Just a couple of images from the symposium. Um, we had a high school smart city DEI hackathon award ceremony, so that was really great. These high school students are phenomenal, like have faith in this next generation. We had um, a SOGIS convict leasing roundtable where we talked about how the community was engaging with um, the school board to create a curriculum. We looked at activism across black Houstons. Our first panel um, of Thursday evening was the Black Houstons and Rice Two Histories, in which I don't know if you can see her in the middle, Miss Velma McAfee Williams, who earned a PhD from Rice in the 60s, but that degree was not conferred upon her until 2016. She got a standing ovation at our symposium. We had an excellent second day at Rice University, using um, the roundtable and panel map models. We did Rethinking Black Houstons and a Houston's Highway and Black Neighborhoods panel that was done by Rice University students. We also had community scholars at the Ancestors in Memory where we had a live libation ceremony. And then also the HBCU Legacy, Art, Archives, and Digital Humanities. This was a panel that was put together by the Texas Southern University Art Museum. Oh, I skipped one. I did it. Find me online. <laughs> I wanted to do a special thanks to my husband and my kids, Amanda Fokey and the archivist at the Woodson Research Center, Maya Rain with Circle, All Real Radio, who did a lot of our promotional materials, the Digital Media Commons at Rice, Moni Maker, who made all of our t-shirts for our volunteers, and Stan at FedEx. So a really exciting opportunity. I want to thank you again. And I just have one question. Will you join me in this picture? Because being a plenary speaker was actually on my bucket list, so. Thank you very much. And now let me invite uh, Taiwo uh, Lasisi from Carnegie Mellon, one of the newest cohort of CLEAR fellows to join us. And Hopefully we can make some AV magic happen. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm glad this worked out well because I'm always one of the persons that gets um, 
this messed up whenever I have a presentation. <laughs> so um, uh, my name is Taiwo Lassisi, and I'm a Claire Postdoctoral Fellow in Community Data Literacy. And I would like to thank CNI, Claire, DLF, and everyone for this unique opportunity um, to share with you my career goals and experiences as a fellow at CMU and what that implies in relation to my current work, partners, projects um, from an interdisciplinary lens. Um, so I currently work at um, Carnegie Mellon University Libraries where I develop um, pedagogy and teach workshops on data management and analysis. And her goal is to give students the fundamental skills they need um, and apply the skills to teach um, in the libraries. And what we do is that we do not only want them to have these skills for educational purposes, for to, but to help them so, um, solve social problems you know, that arises in the course of the activities. And so you know, that helps them really put their education in context. So one of the workshops that I teach um, include coding and qualitative data. And um, anytime I mention to, the, to people and I say, oh, I teach coding and qualitative data, um, some are like, what, what's that? <laughs> you know, they don't, some don't know that um, coding exists in the context of um, you know, qualitative research and qualitative data. Um, so that's um, one of the things that I'm also trying to push forward you know, in this course and help people um, realize that they can have um, substantial um, knowledge when it comes to coding, you know, interviews, um, text, uh, videos, and things like that as related to qualitative data. Um, so I'm going to speak more um, on teaching qualitative coding a little bit um, in the next slide. But I also want to mention that some of the other things that um, we do in the libraries in which I am part of is facilitating and publicizing interdisciplinary and interdepartmental events that promote community interests. Uh, we recently just concluded the citizen science and community data event, which was moderated by the CMU Dean of Libraries, um, Kate Webster, was excited to see Kate here today. Um, um, and also led by my current supervisor, Emma Sladen, and publicized um, by different individuals and groups, including myself. Um, the event is focused on inspiring engagement between CMU and local communities. Um, the other thing I also do is to help students understand data management plan um, in the context of their own research um, because um, every data management plan can be unique um, depending on the kind of research at hand. Um, so touching a little bit more on qualitative coding, I teach um, CMU students in Pittsburgh um, as well as CMU Qatar students. Um, how to code um, text, how to transcribe, you know, audios and videos, and just um, how to um, know how to use um, qualitative software packages like Envivo and MassQDA. Um, I also teach how to use these software packages to analyze and interpret their data, and like I said, answer their unique um, research questions. Um, I answer questions related to validity and reliability um, of qualitative data and analysis through inter-rater reliability check discussions. So um, talking about um, my partners, um, I work with the director of the Sustainability Initiative at CMU, Alex Inikar, and serve on the initiative's advisory board. And what we do um, combines educating students and faculty and exploring the university's connectedness um, to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals you know, through teaching and um, research, community engagement, and, um, and the likes. Um, a great thing is that in 2020, CMU became the first university to perform a voluntary university review, and I feel very lucky um, to be part of the team that facilitated the 2020 Voluntary University Review process. 
Um, I also work with the Center for Shared Prosperity um, at CMU, and my role is to collaborate with um, community partners and on social and environmental justice issues. Uh, we also give free workshops um, to our community partners, and these workshops are actually open to anyone interested within and outside CMU. I am currently moving forward conversations with um, Chelsea Cohen, um, an executive fellow at the Office of the President, and Jessica Benner, um, a lyceum at um, the University Libraries. And what we are really um, trying to do is um, uh, we're trying to identify processes um, and practices to celebrate and better um, coordinate um, the many community-based research and engagement activities that is happening around campus. And by the way, <laughs> that is, you know, me and some students um, in, the, uh, in that, uh, this wonderful picture, just trying to talk more about how their project, you know, is relevant to the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals, and now they can actually, you know, affect um, the communities they are um, through their own research. So I'm speaking on my own personal research. Um, my research project is called the DAPGEF project, um, which focuses on the problematics of greenhouse emissions and flooding, particularly in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I am currently working on the chronology and historical trends of flooding in Pittsburgh, um, especially in places like um, Shady Sides, and outside um, the community of Pittsburgh, um, especially in places like Mayville. Um, and so what uh, we are doing right now is I'm currently collaborating with other um, library partners and we are working, on, we are working with coastal professionals and community-based organization to begin important conversations that speak to the effect of flooding in affected localities in Pittsburgh and other neighboring communities, um, which, you know, has kick-started my data collection process. And some of the um, research questions that I'm working on um, on this, this subset of my research, which um, focuses on the issue of flooding in Pittsburgh, is I'm trying to um, explore how the trajectory of flooding in Pittsburgh has changed um, over time, especially from the modern era to current times. I'm also examining the effects of flooding in Pittsburgh's fl um, floodplain communities and how the problem of flooding can be ameliorated in such communities. Um, and lastly, um, on the issue of flooding, I'm looking at the roles of community-based organization and environmental organization in addressing the problem of flooding in floodplain areas in Pittsburgh communities. It is important um, to mention um, that it can be sometimes um, demanding, imagine how this, you know, work together, you know, working with um, the libraries, working with the um, um, Center for Shared Prosperity and the Sustainability Initiatives at CMU um, all at once. It can be, you know, quiet. <laughs> sometimes I'm like, oh, so what am I gonna do? So it's gonna be quite um, demanding to um, match this. Um, but one thing that has um, worked for me and has helped me um, balance this is that the needs um, of the students are also usually the needs of the community members. So for example, um, I teach coding, um, um, qualitative coding, and I realized that um, Many students are interested and many community members like nonprofit organizations are also interested and have you know, attended these workshops you know, subsequently, I mean from the past and we're planning to do more um, for subsequent events. And so um, this is important because um, I have been able to um, meet the overlapping demand of both students and community members um, to bridge that gap. Um, I would also like to mention that although um, we recognize that CMU is an interesting context because we are very siloed, um, for instance, our computer science department um, does not very often, you know, talk to or relate to our College of Humanities, and the libraries can be sometimes left out as well. 
Um, so as we have as we have to overcome barriers to connect more with our communities, we also need to overcome barriers um, to connect with students across departments. And um, I'll be really interested, you know, to connect um, and learn from individuals and um, community partners and um, institutions represented here on how to um, move forward as we look towards a brighter future. Thank you. And I think, and I think I'm going to be like um, Patricia and take um, a picture because this is one of my bucket lists as well. <laughs> so if you don't mind. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much. What a cool project. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to uh, invite Heidi Nichols from um, Johns Hopkins to uh, join us at the podium. Um, thank you, Cliff Lynch, for um, inviting us and for organizing and for all your help so far getting ready for the conference. Um, and thank you to Clear as well um, and my fellow panelists. I love hearing about all your work so much. Um, I'm Dr. Heidi Nichols. I'm a postdoctoral fellow, a clear postdoctoral fellow, and a Black Beyond Data postdoctoral fellow, which is a Mellon-funded initiative um, that is across a few institutions, but it's also at uh, Johns Hopkins University. And so I'm presenting part of the tiny part of Black Beyond Data that I work on that is around um, health and medicine and racism, and the project is titled Otherwise Bodies. I started as a postdoc in, um, in this year, 2022 in the fall, and so this project is a little bit more in its infancy than my um, fellow scholars, but uh, I'm really excited to share it with you. Um, so like I said, Black Beyond Data is a mellowed funded lab that brings together the digital back black humanities, um, computational humanities, and community engagement. And in general, it's about data for black life, for black freedom, and also um, black study more broadly. The three co-PIs who are also my mentors, you can see here, this is um, Drs. Kim Gallen, Sasha White, and Jessica Marie Johnson. And um, it's really organized around these three pillars, again, like I said, black community data, health data, which is um, the, the section I work on the most, and then slavery and data, which is uh, Dr. Sasha White and Dr. Marie Johnson's specialties. So I'm not gonna go through this, you might not be able to read it all, but just to show you how much Black Beyond Data is involved in, the little red circle is my section. I'm happy to answer any questions about all the work that's being done, um, if you have questions later in the Q&A or later in the conference. So the racism and medicine component, um, we're, we're both sociologists and also kind of historically minded sociologists of health and empire, and so, Together, we're thinking about the ongoing realities of racism in medicine, but more from that historical lens and also a place-based lens. So I've launched Otherwise Bodies. You're, you're free to go to the website now. It's in its infancy, but it's an interactive and public digital humanities project that explores health and medicine amidst empire, particularly centering the history of Hopkins itself as a leader in US medicine, but also as an institution that has been mired in kind of colonial processes um, since 1887 when it was founded. And by empire, I mean the United States as an empire from um, 1776 to the present. So thinking about empire in the sense of the lands on the continent, unincorporated and incorporated territories, um, and also lands occupied by US governing institutions and militaries. So I, I come to this work, just a little bit about my own positionality. Um, I grew up in Hawaii, I'm a white settler colonist from Hawaii, from Oahu, which you see here. And so um, this comes from theories of settler colonialism that, that is out of indigenous feminisms, like how Nani K. Trask, you see this quote. And so um, I think foregrounding the imperial structure of the United States leads to better analysis of social problems like health inequalities. And so Black Beyond Data is trying to integrate an understanding of anti-blackness and health and medicine with anti-indigeneity and settler colonialism. And so this project has three parts. Part one is seeing empire. And so this will be 
a public-facing digital history of Hopkins and other health institutions in Baltimore, including um, interactive maps that kind of connect both the local histories of displacement in East Baltimore around the medical campuses with kind of the global health research that Hopkins has done that has been both beneficial, but also, again, mired in these colonial practices. Um, and so as I'm doing archival work at the Chesney Medical Archives in Hopkins, I'm also helping the archivists there edit the metadata and the collection descriptions to note kind of the ways in which these histories of racial formation and colonialism are part of uh, the, the institutional archives as well. And so then um, we're also focusing on how the settlement of uh, Baltimore itself, including Hopkins, um, transformed native spaces such as the Piscataway and Susquehannock lands that, Hos that um, Hopkins occupies, um, again, with these larger imperial interactions. So here's just one example from the archives. Um, you know, in 1887, the hospital at Hopkins is founded. And in the institutional archives, you can see all these ways that early physicians that kind of became the leaders of US medicine were, were traveling around with US occupations, such as in the Philippines. And then a more local example, this is um, a framework of thinking about how the spatial changes around East Baltimore mirror settler colonial processes. So the ways that black Baltimoreans, as they get to dispossessed from the neighborhoods that they lived in for sometimes generations, it really um, mirrors the way that settler colonialism dispossesses indigenous um, peoples. And of course, also there are black, Baltimore, more black Baltimoreans who are also native. So this is an image created by one of the community organizations we're partnering with, where you can see they are reframing this thing called um, East Baltimore Development Initiative to everybody is displaced intentionally. The second part is racialized bodies. Um, and this is more narrowly focused on medical professionals and the uses of race in clinical settings. So we're going to be um, partnering with physicians and medical students to um, create a summer institute on structural competencies in medical education. So again, I'm a sociologist, structural competency being, you know, these, these broader historical macro ways of thinking about how race impacts the human body. And we've actually applied for a couple of large grants to fund this. I'm very excited about that. And the overall objective is to um, equip health professionals, but also bring them together to do a symposium of capstone research and pedagogical initiatives that will also be on the otherwise body site so that it can travel beyond Hopkins to, to other um, health institutions and be a resource, I think, um, also maybe for um, people who are not as connected to large health institutions. So then finally, um, this is the most community-oriented part of the project, the part that I'm also mo most excited about, um, is called Unruly Futures. And um, it's gonna invite contributions from community members in East Baltimore itself, um, both artists, um, people who are affiliated with Hopkins or not, um, people doing kind of social medicine and mutual aid, um, also the medical students who live around East Baltimore who are beginning their med medical education, um, a number of different actors, and the hope is to have an online zine and repository that remembers and envisions how people have cared for themselves um, amidst empire, both historically, but also um, as people have tried to stay healthy, such as during the pandemic, or at other times when um, health institutions have still been exclusionary or violent towards them. And so, again, it'll include things like social medicine, mutual aid, traditional or decolonial health practices. And I'm still learning a lot of the DH tools that I can use for this. Um, so I'm gonna be learning from my, my uh, fellow panelists here and from others. So um, yeah, I'm excited that, I, that I'm learning these tools. Okay, and this is inspired by, um, I don't know if any of you have read, Linda Tuhiwai Smith's Decolonizing Methodologies, which is mostly about social scientific research, but I think it has a lot to say for um, libraries and for DH in general. Um, she says that we can really bind people together by asking people to do these kind of imaginative, future-oriented projects that have uh, the capacity to bring people together politically for things that we want to change. 
These are the community partnerships that we're building over time. St. Francis Neighborhood Center in East Baltimore is actually a co-PI on Black Beyond Data, so they're a really solidified community member, one of the oldest neighborhood centers in Baltimore. I'm hoping to do stuff with them around these histories of race and empire with also young people who they, um, they serve. And then BRACE, I mentioned before, is the Baltimore Redevelopment Action Coalition for, empowering, uh, for Empowerment, and they're mostly an organization in response to, again, uh, Hopkins as an institution, dispossessing black Baltimoreans, and also um, contributing to gentrification in, in Baltimore in general. So then, wrapping up, my overall goals um, as a sociologist, as an educator, as someone um, gaining skills in the, in the digital humanities and health humanities, I really wanna build these kind of interactive digital tools that um, help people see, literally see through, you know, through the digital and through these kind of mappings and maybe even some augmented reality stuff, see empire, see this historical and structural foundation of racism, because that's something I think you can't um, disentangle. And then also doing more collaborative projects that, that think otherwise, that think about the future, the kinds of futures we might have, the ways that people might stay healthy and take care of one another, um, both with these health institutions but also apart from them if needed. Um, and so, with that, I wanna leave you with these images of a, of a Baltimore AI reimagined with maybe healthier ways to feed ourselves, healthier cities, de decolonized cities even, in the future that could exist. Um, and I thank you for listening. Feel free to give me feedback at any point during the conference, um, and feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. And um, now I would like to invite Sinatra Smith to join us. Um, she is working with the Philadelphia Art Museum and with Temple. Right. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to share with you what I've been doing in my fellowship so far. Uh, when I got the original invitation to participate in this panel, I was reminded that we did this in 2021. And I thought, oh my God, I have no idea what I said before. Whoever that girl is, I don't know her because I've done a lot of different things since then. Um, I am the Clear Fellow at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and Temple University Libraries. And I've had an excellent time in this fellowship despite uh, starting during the pandemic. And I was able to find some ways to kind of take advantage of the time that I had on my hands while I was learning my institutions virtually, working remote for one institution the entire first year, the other institution 18 months, and then eventually working in person starting, um, I believe, February of last year. And I've been in this fellowship since July of 2020, so very strange beginning. But since I had that extra time to kind of do some things that would um, contribute to my own professional development, I started with getting the Society of American Archivists Digital Archive Specialist certification online. And I was able to do the entire process online because one of the courses is supposed to be at like a in-person conference. That wasn't an option. So I was able to uh, complete that during the first year, year and a half of the fellowship. I also participated in the inaugural cohort of the Association for African American Museums and Howard University School of Business Advanced Executive Leadership Certification. And this past summer at the AAAM conference, I was awarded the Pace Setter Award, which is for folks who are within the first 10 years of your museum career who are just changing the game and you know, raising the standards for things that are possible in the, in the field. I've also had a really fantastic opportunity to participate in some collaborative projects, um, and I wanna highlight a few of those here. One is the Creating Access to HBCU Library Collections project, which Portia actually found and invited me to work with her as a co-PI, and it was a partnership between CLEAR and the HBCU Library Alliance where we were um, interviewing folks that work at five specific institutions about challenges um, for gaining access to their special collections and archival records. Um, another project is 500 Years of African American History in South Florida, another one that Portia brought to me. <laughs> Portia has been really helping my CV. Um, and uh, it's through the National Park Service and the 
and ASALA, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And we were able to apply for a micro grant through CLEAR to bring on Dr. Luling Huang, who's a fellow at um, Carnegie Mellon, who's also here. Hi, Luling. And um, he's kind of like our data person for the micro grant side of the project. And so we're documenting uh, black history in South Florida. So from like Palm Beach all the way down to the Florida Keys, we've done three. Uh, research trips. This was from our most recent one outside of the Cape Florida Lighthouse. And so we've had a really good time getting to know each other through that project. And then the last is the Curated Futures Project, which was a clear digital publication. Um, I was one of the editors on that project. And we're also publishing an addendum this spring um, that's connected to a symposium I did last year that I'll, I'll talk more about in the next slide. Or, yeah, in the next slide. <laughs> So I come to this work as a former museum practitioner or professional. I was working at a small uh, black institution in Prince George's County, Maryland, which we call Gorgeous Prince George's. It's, uh, it was, but has now been replaced, but it, at the time it was the largest jurisdiction of affluent black folks in the country. Um, now to be surpassed by Charles County, which is right next door. So, you know, still our neighbors, which is a good, which is a good time. Um, so when I first got into the position, I was working on a Wikidata project to enhance the digital visibility of black artists in the Philadelphia Museum of Arts collection. So in order to make an edit to a Wikidata, which is what feeds into the Google Knowledge Graph, so when you're doing a search, this is how folks are able to come up, um, you have to have a reference URL in order, to, or you should, it'll flag you if you don't use one, it'll still allow you to input the information, but you all are probably familiar with Wikidata. So um, we started with doing a blog um, aspect of the project so that those URLs could exist. So I was doing biographical research on our black artists and then publishing a blog on our library and archives website, on our, our LibGuides website, so that that URL that had the full um, bibliography attached to it could be used as the reference URL as I was making Wikidata edits. And I was just counting this morning, I published 102 blogs, on, each on a different artist, and I think I made edits on actually 100 artists, not 102, there were, there were two that were just very well documented and I didn't need to add anything to their records. I also created a Zotero list that uh, tracks all of the research that I've done, it includes links to the artwork and archival records and library special collections that are in our museum's collection. And you can find more information about how to design such a project at the link at the bottom of the left side of the screen, bit.ly slash Wikidata blogs. It turned into a larger project where we did a Wikidata edit-a-thon with both of the institutions that I worked for during the pandemic since it was a virtual world and it kind of worked really well. We also brought on some fellows through the leading fellowship that's hosted through Jex Drexel University, and um, I did some training with them. So the blogs that are listed on that link are the blogs that we all wrote as a part of the project. The next thing I was able to do was to um, do a black uh, digital humanities symposium at Temple University. So last year the theme was uh, Afrofuturism, and we had a new, I think he's a grad director of the Africology and Africa, Africana Studies, African American Studies Department. Um, Dr. Ronaldo Anderson was our keynote speaker, which was fantastic. And we had some scholars come in, and there was a, a book uh, that was published at the Bloxon Collection, which I also work at, the Charles L. Bloxon Afro American Collection at Temple University. Everything has such a long title. Um, so they published the Black Lives Always Mattered graphic novel. So you'll see in this picture Eric Battle, who has on the blue shirt was the illustrator for that book. So we were able to do some really good things with folks who were working with the institution and folks who were coming from outside of the institution for that symposium. And then we also did a professional pathways in Black DH uh, workshop for folks who are either just getting started or kind of interested in Black DH. And so we, got, we had a panel of folks come and do um, like smaller breakout room chats with the attendees and the other folks in my cohort really helped out with that and moderated some of the rooms. Portia, Petrushka, Francina, who I don't think is here, helped with that, um, that program, so that was fantastic. And so this year we're doing it again. Our theme this year is Black Virtual Futures and it's about the metaverse and so we've got VR and black creatives who use XR tools. Petrushka will be speaking at that as well. I always like to shout you guys out. Um, and then the day before that is when we're doing our workshop. So it's in person, the, uh, the symposium. If you're in the Philadelphia region and you'd like to come, there's a link so that you can register. It's all day, it's free, we're providing food. The uh, workshop that's the day before is 
uh, remote, but that one is completely booked, so I didn't add that link here. And then the last thing, which is the most important part of what I've been doing as a part of my fellowship, at least in my opinion, um, is that I've been working with a lot of XR tools. Because of the department that I work in at Temple, we're like the gaming department. Our department head makes board games and has a huge library of board games in his home. Um, we've got someone in the department that makes VR games as like his hobby. So we do a lot with gaming tools in addition to traditional DH tools. So I have been able to develop some different projects as a result of that. So the first one is um, a story map that's highlighting, it's gonna kind of load very slowly, that's highlighting the origins of African sculptures in PMA's European Painting and Sculptures Department because those items exist there based on the provenance, but they obviously don't show where the items come from on the continent. So I worked with a previous fellow, Dr. Hillary Witham Sanchez, who helped us, helped me kind of understand what's in the collection. She was doing research on the, the objects to update their web labels on our collection site. And I was able to speak with the uh, curator that works with those objects to select those that would be suitable for photogrammetry and weren't too fragile to be moved around because they needed to be on a turntable and rotate as I was taking the photos. So we developed this story map, story map based on the research that she had done um, identifying where the objects are from and if it will allow me to actually show the map. Yes, it loaded, fantastic, it's coming. There you go. So we're able to see what parts of the continent our objects come from and she's got more information about each of them which I was able to add to this story map. So as it goes through, it shows you an image of the object which is cut off because of the format of this screen but if you look at it on a website, you'll be able to see the full image. Um, and the item name and its accession numbers to find it on our collections website a lot easier. The web label that was updated with a research attribution because she, her fellowship ended and she took the project with her to her students who, that she was working with at Villanova University to continue to do that research. So I've got a research attribution for each of these so we know who worked on which uh, label. And then there's a button to see the 3D model um, for those that have one and at the bottom, it's gonna take forever to scroll through that. Let's do it this way. At the bottom, there's the full collection of objects from this project, which of course, again, on the website, you can see the full collection a lot easier. And then a photo, a, a TikTok of me doing photogrammetry, which I'll show you at the end. The next project was to bring in an XR tool. So I used those, uh, those models from the previous project in this one with some additional models that I created because I wanted to learn how to, use, um, how to create an augmented reality uh, iOS app. So if you click on the, or if you are able to capture that uh, QR code on the screen, it takes you to the app store. You could also just search for, oh, I don't have the name there. Sacred GS AR app is how you find it in the app store. It's not for Android, I'm not a developer, so I was just kind of seeing how to do these things. I'm an Apple user, so that's what I decided to, to go with. And so this one is similar where there's a story map, but this is mapping public art from Philadelphia, murals and sculptures. So this is the full map. They're all by black artists. It's not a comprehensive representation of murals. There are 3,600 murals that cover the city of Philadelphia. It's called Mural City for a reason. So there was no way I was gonna be able to capture all of those. So I just had a small subset of murals that I worked with Mural Arts Philadelphia to identify that featured um, some type of, it was, it was a African-American iconic images resource. And then I did some research on the artist to find out who was, uh, which murals were painted by black artists and then went ahead with that. Um, and so I'm going to come out of the presentation, yes. And I'm gonna show you how the AR app works live. And so this was all made through Unity, the, the app part of it, with no coding involved. So as you uh, capture the image that's on the, the map, there's an altar that I built using 3D models of different objects from the, the projects that I've been working on and they, the sculptures all rotate 360, and the murals just kind of swing back and forth because the backside of a 3D model of a, of a mural is just the inverse of the mural. There's nothing really interesting to look at behind it. And they automatically change based on the photo. And so you can see there's the Kifuebe mask that's in the Philadelphia Museum of Arts uh, collection. I'm trying to hold my hand as steady as possible. Okay. 
I'm going to go back into this presentation. Yes. And the last project that I want to highlight, which is something that's kind of been on the back burner a little bit throughout the entire uh, fellowship so far, and now I'm actively working on it again. I made a 3D model of a black woman-owned bookstore in the Fishtown neighborhood of Philadelphia called Harriet's Bookshop. And it's named Harriet after Harriet Tubman. And um, I'm turning it into a virtual exhibition space. So I was able to add all of the African sculpture 3D models that I have. I've got an additional set of, of uh, African instruments that I modeled that are from the blocks and collection that are also in the space. And it's also got the models of the public art. They're on the lower level, which it's going to now. And uh, then I added uh, images of artwork by black women who are from Philadelphia or have lived in Philadelphia that are in the PMA's collection. There aren't that many black artists in our collection, and so it's really nice to be able to highlight them through these projects. So right now I'm at the step of adding interactivity to this where you can pick up an object and then a label pops up and it's narrated to you for accessibility. So you have the option of reading it or listening to it or both if you, know, you wanna do that. Um, and it shows an, an image of the object in real life because the 3D model doesn't always look exactly the same. So that kind of helps with being able to imagine it outside of the virtual space. But I have been able to test it and put on the headset and everything, but that's something you have to do at the Scholar Studio. All right, so thank you all for listening. I'm really excited to hear any questions you might have, and you can reach me um, on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash in slash Sinatra Smith PhD. And this is just a TikTok that I made actively doing the photogrammetry with one of the African sculptures. So it doesn't fall. <laughs>
next year for. Um, and so I'm excited um, to start that and also look forward to other exciting things that I'll do related to data management and working with the libraries and you know everyone who is interested in data. Okay, yes, it's working. I'm really excited that you asked that question because there's something that I usually say during my presentation that I forgot to mention and it's the answer to the question which is that I have been doing this work and building workflows that would be that would work at small institutions that have limited capacity, limited funding, limited staffing, all of that, right? I was able to do a lot of this stuff either by myself or with one other person. Um, I didn't have to use a huge grant or anything in order to afford it. Most of the tools that I've been using are free. If they're not free, they're very, very inexpensive. Um, and so coming from a space where we could sometimes look to a county council person to give us a couple thousand dollars to do some programming in their district, this would be something that they would be able to replicate at one of those types of institutions. And so I'm very active in the Association for African American Museums. I'm a life member, which I'm very excited about. And I am currently on um, a working group to develop ways to build capacity using traveling shared and collaborative exhibitions. Two of us are DH folks, myself and Dr. Brian Carter, who runs the lab at the University of Arizona. And so he and I have been talking about how we might be able to do some workshops for AAAM members so that um, the members can learn how to do this work without having to contract a large company or get a giant grant and bring on staff. They could really do it with the folks that they already have. There's no coding involved. So just someone who's interested in learning the skill has a little bit of time to add it onto any existing um, responsibilities, just kind of being realistic about what would be expected of that person. And so in 20 years, I hope, well, I hope it doesn't take that long to get to this point. <laughs> But in 20 years, I hope that I am actively doing that work and training other people on how to use, how to do AR, VR, how we can build these projects for ourselves instead of allowing someone else to do that work on our behalf. Um, all of that sounded amazing. Um, yeah, 20 years is a long time. And I want to be an educator um, and I want to keep trying to make the university a different kind of space than I think it currently is and kind of reimagining what it means to be a researcher and an educator um, and really doing work you know like this this project I'm doing now otherwise bodies I hope it is community engaged but also is the kind of research and work that builds community and connects existing communities to each other rather than it being like through a university necessarily. Um, and that that could challenge kind of the epistemic boundaries and archival boundaries that we usually have. Do we have some questions from the audience? Here comes one. Um, thank you for this. It's really, really exciting work. It's just, and Brian, Kim, Gallon, all these people I love and work with, so I'm really glad to see that. There's a question, an, an interesting generational gap here, so I'm going to ask the question from my side. A lot of you are doing interdisciplinary and working across boundaries of community, academic institutions. I'm wondering if you have any advice, because the problem with working with communities, community orgs, higher education institutions, keeps cropping up in a lot of our work. How do you work across those boundaries? Any advice would you like to share in terms of how you have accomplished any challenges? regarding community-based work with the kind of things that you're doing? That's an excellent question. Um, so this is, these are personal experiences, but I found that just being present in the community is um, something that, that helps build community in and of itself. There tends to be um, some distrust, mistrust of um, academic institutions, and sometimes we tend to extract instead of pour in. And so for me, it's very important that I'm pouring in um, and breaking down barriers 
There's a saying at Rice that uh, things that happen beyond the hedges, right? Um, and we're really trying to pull some of those hedges down. We're doing that work through um, the metadata that, that we're updating in the library. We're doing that work in imagining um, archival futures that include more community voices. But we're also being very intentional about the work that we're doing with communities. And um, part of that is just being present in the community, being active in the community, and um, allowing for those relationships to be built organically, but then also tapping into those networks. So for example, there are several community members that we've worked with that know someone that knows someone, right? And so one of the things that I found to be very rewarding in this work is building that network, that family, that group of um, like-minded, individuals that are interested in being in the trenches with you because it is difficult work doing community driven work and recognizing that um, there is a history of extraction that has to be addressed before we can move forward in a healing way. Um, yeah, and I would just, you know, had to um, the amazing advice that Pasha already um, I gave and for me one unique thing that I've always you know considered when it comes to you know building community relationships and you know citizen science and things like that is that I I usually um, make sure that the research that we are doing you know as a group or as a university is community oriented you know so we don't just when we are relating with community members we don't just come up with a research um, that and push it to them and just believe that it will benefit them, but asking them for their needs, you know, and you know, tying what we do to the community needs so that you know it is actually really impactful. So that way, you know, we meet with you know community champions and people who are community oriented and know the needs of some of these communities, and then we connect that way and we build networks and relationships in ways that really matter, you know, answering. Community, um, community questions that matter to the community. So um, that's what I feel like it's most um, important um, to kick start breaking, you know, community engagement barriers. And so it's really answering their needs, knowing their need, not assuming their needs, you know, knowing these needs and then channeling, you know, um, symposium research and or whatever um, universities, you know, and other partners have in mind and then focusing on answering those needs. So I have come at community in kind of a different way. At some point during my fellowship, I had to think about who is my actual target audience. And I realized that it's, like I said before, other museum um, professionals. So I've really tapped into my professional association as a way to get in touch with those folks. The working group that I'm a part of came out of the 2017 needs assessment to identify what are the actual struggles of our member institutions, the majority of whom are small institutions, of course. And um, so we're doing an updated study about, well, what are the perceived challenges when it comes to doing collaborative exhibitions or to using uh, digital tools for those exhibitions? And uh, we're hoping that we'll be able to do some workshops uh, before this uh, working group uh, term is up in a couple of years. Um, but I, I've really been keen on making sure that I'm developing tools that are developing workflows that will work for our member institutions. And then because they are usually really tapped into their local communities, that's a way that they're able to kind of target their audiences more specifically than me trying to figure it out for them. Um, I'll just briefly add, so um, I'm really, excited that I get to learn from the mentors I had on the screen earlier, uh, Dr. Kim Gallen and Dr. Sasha White and Jessica Marie Johnson. Um, they all live in Baltimore and East Baltimore. I also live in East Baltimore. And particularly, Dr. Kim Gallen has had a long relationship um, before she moved institutions with St. Francis, who again is a PI, a co-PI on that Mellon grant. So really having community organizations be um, PIs on these grants, and then and then being able to um, use use that money um, to go directly into communities. So the community data stewards, part of the community data lab of Black Beyond Data, they are all paid positions um, for community members to be the community data stewards. And again, um, also 
you know, in the future we want to have a community advisory board for the race and medicine, uh, racism and medicine component that would also be full of uh, paid community members. And so it's, it would be compensated and, and very formally structured in that way. I hate to say this, but we are at time. That was, I think you'll agree, a really fascinating set of presentations. And thank you for that wonderful question, by the way, that we closed on, because um, that really is a, a major challenge in so many projects now. Um, I am hopeful that all of you will be with us for at least most of the meeting, that you'll be able to join us for the reception tonight. I'm sure there are many people who are eager to chat with you. Um, and please join me in a final round of applause for our wonderful Clearfellows. <laughs>